welcome. Thanks for joining us. Another Monday, another episode of The Nonprofit Show. We are so thrilled to have you here tuning in with us, either live or watching one of our recordings. Today, we have Chris Bavalock with us, and he's going to talk to us about your financial transparency for your nonprofit. So before we get started with our conversation with Chris, Julia and I, of course, want to make sure that you remember who we are. Uh, we've only done 600 episodes together, but we are working towards another 600. Julia Patrick, thank you, my friend, uh, for creating this wonderful platform. Julia remains as the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, and I get to have fun each and every day alongside as your co-host. I'm Jarrett Ransom your nonprofit nerd, CEO of The Raven Group. And we are honored to have the continued support and investment from our presenting sponsors. So thank you very much to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, National University with the Fundraising Academy, Nonprofit Nerd, your part-time controller, staffing boutique, and the nonprofit thought leader. I like to remind you that these companies show up day in, day out for you. Um, so please do check them out. And of course, if you've missed any of our episodes, also thanks to our sponsors, we can allow uh, you to find any and all of these episodes on Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, as well as Vimeo. And for those of you that are podcast listeners, Go ahead and queue up the nonprofit show on your wherever you stream your podcast and you can listen to us there. So again, thank you to our sponsors and to our executive producer that keeps these platforms updated. So we're so very grateful to, to have the, the holistic support of everyone. You know, again, I shared today, we're going to talk about finances and we're going to get down and nerdy with Chris ba Bavalock here, uh, Director of Finance and Operations. Thrilled to have you, Chris. Welcome. Thanks very much. Really happy to be here. You know, um, Chris and I started working, Jarrett, several months ago, and I don't even think you know this, um, on a series of training videos. Um, and it's a partnership with the American Nonprofit Academy and Chazen and Company. They only do nonprofit accounting services. And so we kind of came together and said, what are some of the topics that nonprofits need to know about? And whether you're in leadership or a board member, I mean, how does this all work? And so um, Chris and I started chatting, really an interesting uh, process for all of us, really had a lot of fun, learned a lot. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that Chris first said to me was about transparency. And we started having some conversations about this. And I was like, wow, <laughs> we need to get you on the nonprofit show and really talk about this because this isn't something that we're, we, we think we understand what it means, but we really don't. And so that's kind of the genesis of this discussion. And so sorry for that long winded introduction or recap, <laughs> Chris, but I wanted to start us off and have you explain to us what is financial transparency and how can it really be a cultural piece of any of our nonprofits. Yeah, okay, so and, and we might take it a little bit further than financial transparency, but that's really the core of it. And think of it like an interpersonal relationship, right? How, how do you build trust in an interpersonal relationship? Well, with honesty and being genuine, transparency. And, and in a sense, nonprofits have relationships with their stakeholders. And so the same, same rules apply. You, you need to show honesty, you need to show transparency. And that's how you build credibility with your with your stakeholders. And so, you know, this is something that uh, I believe is fundamentally important to not only each and every nonprofit, but the nonprofit sector as a whole. That 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 whole idea of being transparent, being being credible, and it really does start with culture. Um, and uh, because you have to have the culture within your organization for this to work. And um, and I realized, you know, we did a we did a counting and chasing episode on this. And, and one thing I didn't mention was really CEOs and executive directors of nonprofits really need to think about, first of all, their internal culture. Is their internal culture transparent? Are they sharing information with their with their staff and the, the, the key leaders of the organization? And then from there, you need to go to the board, of course, and hopefully you're being transparent with the board of everything because they're fiduciarily responsible for the organization. But, you know, again, is that level of transparency there? And from that, 
Uh, if those are in place from that, you can develop a culture of transparency that is external to your stakeholders. So again, that, that word culture is, is very important and everyone needs to buy into it and everyone needs to support it and believe it's, it's important. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And are there requirements for transparency, especially with financials? Because I know the 990s, um, that's public information. So what are the requirements of being transparent? Yeah, the requirements far, uh, vary. The, the 990 is the, is the big one. The Form 990 needs to be available to anyone who wants to see it upon request. And there's a there's a redacted um, Form 990 that takes out some key uh, private information that your auditor provides uh, or your tax preparer can provide you. Um, but um, it at, that needs to be available. Beyond that, every state has different rules and regulations as to what needs to be presented. So you need to be well aware of what your the state in which you are incorporated and what that state that state requires. Um, but to be honest, this is not so much about what's required. It's about what is what you're going to do that's sort of the right thing to do and it's going to help you as a nonprofit build stronger relationships with those that support you. I love that you said that because there's a big difference between being compelled to do something. You know, we use the word compliance all the time versus offering it up and saying, this is the right way to operate. It's really an interesting thing. And I see what you're saying about going back to the, the concept of culture. So let me ask this question then, who is actually benefiting from this? And when we talk about financial transparency, who's our audience? Yeah. So first of all, um, you know, I, I believe, as I mentioned at the top, um, you know, that the nonprofits benefit from transparency and the nonprofit sector as a whole, because it just builds credibility all around for the for the sector and the nonprofit. But when you think about stakeholders, you think about all the people that come into contact with your organization, and you know, certainly their donors, their uh, their grantors, volunteers not just the volunteers that help you on the front lines deliver your mission day in and day out, but the volunteers who are on your board and committees. Um, you have partners, probably, you have vendors, uh, you have the people who benefit from your services and their stakeholders as well. So everybody, that whole sort of ecosystem of stakeholders benefits from a transparent culture. And um, I think nonprofits need to generally operate with their eyes wide open to who those stakeholders are and how how this type of uh, culture and transparency is is beneficial. We were talking to one of our guests, and this makes me think of it here as well. Is uh, don't share anything that you're uncomfortable with it getting out past you know a, a certain ripple effect. So if you share with a certain stakeholder group, have the assumption that it will be shared beyond that circle. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I can only imagine that it makes us think and maybe pause, okay, what are we sharing and are we truly comfortable with this information getting out beyond the intended recipients? Um, so how much do we share? Like what's the best practice for, you know, a baseline being transparent and then even, you know, uh, I don't know, going above and beyond that baseline. What does that look like? Yeah, so it can it can look like a very a variety of things. Um, first of all, if you Google on nonprofit transparency, you're going to find a few organizations that have done checklists of things that that should be shared to be considered to be transparent, and that's a good that's a really good starting point. Um, but it could be, for instance, your uh, organizational documents to start your nonprofit letter, your articles of corporation, your bylaws, the Form 990 certainly. If you're audited, your audit report. Um, your list of board of directors, key staff members, and, and maybe it's their backgrounds as well. So people understand who's on your board and, and, and what experience they have uh, in the area. Key policies are helpful as well um, because, you know, a lot of credibility has to do with, are you protecting the resources you're being given? Because essentially people are saying, you know, I'm going to give you, or you're actually what the nonprofit is saying to people, you give me your money, you give me your time, and we're going to turn it into something better for the common good. We're going to make it into something better. So they want to feel that that's actually going to happen. So conflict of interest policy, whistleblower policy, give, pe give people more comfort that you're, you're doing the right things to make sure that there isn't fraud or misuse of funds. Um, if you have a strategic plan, you might want to share that. If you have an annual report, 
uh, certainly you'd, you'd want to put that out. And I also don't want people to feel intimidated by the amount of the work. You know, uh, it, it doesn't, I guess back in the day when I grew up and things were printed, we talked about, you know, the glossy annual reports, now they're PDFs or they're shared digitally or whatever. It, it doesn't mean a 20 page report. It could be a couple pages that just summarize, you know, what your funding is, how you're using your funding, the number of people you serve and what your, what your goals are, just to give people an interest, uh, an idea of, of your path and, and where you're, where you're trying to go. Um, so don't think that you need to put hours and hours and hours into a, a fancy formal strategic plan or, or annual report. It can be a, just a little bit of information. People get sensitive about, well, what about bad things that happen to our organization? What if we have a bad financial year or there's, there's something about our organization? Well, to be honest, being transparent means sharing it all, sharing the good and the bad, but you don't just share the bad and that with no information alongside it, you maybe share, okay, we had a bad financial year, but here's what the board and the organization are doing to get back on track. This is what we're doing to take better steps, to get our finances back in order, to get to, to serve more people, to serve more people more efficiently. Whatever the story is for your nonprofit, what people want to know is that they, again, can trust you and can trust the information that you're getting. Um, organizations that typically hide information you know, they're, they're probably looked at a little bit more critically as to whether uh, people want to invest their time and resources there. Yeah, that's very interesting, you know, to not share just the good, but to share the real realistic, which might not be so so sunshine and roses. Um, so how do you recommend we share this beyond posting it on our website? Are there other key ways to disseminate this information? To be honest, putting it on your website is really the, the key way to do it. And maybe you do it under your about tab. Everybody has an about tab. And you have you could have a, a, a link under there that says transparency or could say financial information or whatever you want to call it. And you basically just package it all under that one place, one-stop shopping for a viewer. They can find, again, whatever financial statements you want to provide, information about your board of directors, about, about your policies, everything that that you feel is part of becoming a trans, transparent organization. And to be honest, under the about tab, it could be under a couple different links under that tab, but, but you get the idea. You go one place, a person can go one place and find all the information they need. Uh, maybe there's three or four years of 990s, maybe there's three or four years of, of audited financials there. So people can see the trend is sometimes, again, you know, we've all been through tough times the last couple of years. There's probably some that have maybe gone down a little bit after two not after 2019 but on the other hand um for a growing organization it can show a really nice trend of how you've how you've grown over the last like i said three or four years um so that's really the the best i think the best way to do it um and you know we've talked about watchdog groups a little bit and guide star and watchdog groups will go to your website and they'll look and see what you have published there and that that impacts their ratings um, GuideStar, although not a watchdog group, has different levels for the uh, information that they provide on organizations. So you might want to go look yourself up on GuideStar and see how they have you rated. Because I, I think it's there's a, a bronze, silver, and gold kind of level uh, within GuideStar that depends on the information you're willing to share uh, to people. So you know, there's a lot of a lot of pluses that can that can happen by by just making it available. You know, I'm fascinated. Um because I, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about like, this is current, you know, the here and the now. I hadn't thought about going back a little bit and, and having some of those um, older pieces of information to give us context and to show the trajectory of where we've been and where we're coming, where we're going to. I think that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. What does that look like to you? Three years, five years. What? Um, it, you know, not I, I'm gonna I'm gonna punt that one a little, and it's that uh, that's really back to the um you know kind of comfort level discussion we were having at the beginning. The staff, the board, need to be comfortable with what they're showing. Now, I would say eight, ten years of nine nineties is probably too many. I'm I'm thinking two two or three generally. You know what the the most recent history of the organization. Um, but because you know, if you're doing this for a long, long time, someone doesn't want to go go there and see all those 990s necessarily. They're really interested in what's happened in in more recent time. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, 
You know, Chris, you taught me that the new thing that's my favorite thing is Schedule O on the 990 should be <laughs> thought of as Schedule Opportunity. Um, and that is that you get a chance to put your narrative forward and talk about your organization in a way that sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, you don't get to, right? And so I see now how this really fits into not only being transparent, but maybe connecting with people that you don't even know you're going to be connecting with, that they seek you out and they find information mm -hmm. and then they make d judgments or decisions about working with you before you might ever even know. Yeah. And you, you actually just said working with you, you know, I didn't really touch on this, um, but think of the current labor market and trying to hire people. Yeah. Well, what, what do you want them to see when they come and do their research on your organization? Do they want to see, an organization that has nothing out there about them, that you don't really get a feel for who they are and, and what they are. Do you want to see an organization that's forthcoming, is sharing information, you can understand where they're going and what they're doing. And, you know, again, it's, we're all struggling in this labor environment to hire good people. You really want to put your best foot forward. So there's another, there's another advantage of doing something like that. Well, and that circles back to the, the culture, right? And so if you are an employee or potential employee seeking, you know, a new opportunity, you're right, Chris, you know, just looking on websites to find out what is the organization sharing? Um, how are they demonstrating transparency in their communication and culture from the onset? And then to watch that journey, you know, perhaps through the interview process and onboarding process. So I've never connected those two in such a cultural way. So thank you for bringing, bringing that to the forefront for me. Sure. You know, Chris, I have another question, and, and, and uh, Jared and I have talked about this a lot, and that is, you know, oftentimes our boards are comprised of business people who um, come at, at nonprofit um, board service with a benevolent heart and attitude, but they don't always understand, you know, the, the, as you would say, the cultural differences or the performance differences. How hard do you think it would be for some of these board members to be comfortable with the dissemination of so much financial information? It, it can be difficult for some. I mean, I've, I've worked with, um, you know, treasurers of nonprofits who come from very large companies and feel that everything should be like that Fortune 500 company that they came from. And <laughs> it takes them a little time to realize that, no, that's not the way the nonprofit world works. But I think, you know, it needs to be explained carefully. And, you know, again, there's lots of different kinds of for-profit companies. There's, there's single ownership for-profit companies, which are very tightly held. The information is very, very private. But then there's uh, companies that sell stock that are on the stock exchange and they're owned by the shareholders. And the SEC requires that certain information is provided. You got to kind of think about it that way. Your stakeholders are your owners. They're the people, again, that are giving you the funds to operate. So what information do they need to keep supporting you? That should be the driving force. That, 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 should, that should be the reason why you want to do that. Now, again, how much information and exactly what information, that still, you know, that still needs to be vetted out and, and agreed upon. But yeah, I can understand why some people would say, whoa, I would never, you know, I, I wouldn't share that or anything. But um, yeah, you, you learn after a while that the, the benefits really are there. Yeah. I have to share too, Chris, that I, and I know I've shared this on the show before, Julia, is that, you know, I was really taken aback by a very savvy donor that they did their due diligence in the financials um, and, you know, these other charity watchdog kind of platforms. And they said, you know, right now we're not comfortable making this large investment um, because, and they, you know, shared the, the points. But if you can get this, you know, improved, then yes, let's circle back in about eight months. And so I bring that up because investors, donors, supporters, they become savvier and savvier as our access to data becomes more and more accessible. So, um, you know, whether we share it or not, I really think that, you know, if there's, if there's a will for our donors to find it or, or any stakeholder group, they will. So why not provide it, you know? Yeah, well, you know, we're an accounting firm that serves nonprofits. So the first thing we're going to say, of course, is that your financial data needs to be accurate and of high integrity. You've got to be able to produce financial statements 
that make sense. And so any uh, potential grantor or any potential donor can look at them and say, okay, I understand financially where your organization is. Mm -hmm. um, but then going, going beyond that and doing the things we're talking about today, I think only strengthens only strengthens the case for someone to to want to give you money. And of course, the more money that's involved, the more important this is going to be. Now, here's a curveball question, and mm -hmm. um, we're notorious for this, but I, I just have to, I know, I, I just have to share, Chris, that, you know, even though we are doing the work of the angels, there are times when bad things happen, right? And there have been cases of, you know, financial misuse and embezzlement. How do you go about addressing this in a transparent way with your stakeholder groups? Very good question. I hate this question, but I love this question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so when we're talking about sharing the good and the bad, it it doesn't necessarily mean all the bad. Some some things are um, are to be dealt with internally or within the board structure, uh, and you know if it now if it's public, if it's become a public thing or something that might become public in the newspapers on the web on a on somebody's website, in which there are millions now then you need to address it very proactively and you need to say, you know, we understand this happened. We're you know, possibly embarrassed that this happened, but we've taken A, B, and C precautions to make sure this never happens again. And that goes from every, everything as serious, from a serious to a fraud incident to, like I said, a bad, a bad financial year where donations sure. go down explain it there's usually there's usually an explanation there's usually some some reason or some type of comfort you can give your folks that this is this is a blip we're turning this around but this is what we're doing this is how the, the board is involved and some some organizations have gone as far to share portions of board minutes or finance committee minutes to show that the board has taken action that there's been very very distinct action that's taken wait, now wait. I, I i mentioned on the the recorded Thing, you know, you have to be careful how your minutes are, are written and all that minutes can be written very different ways and some are overly detailed and those are the ones you might not want to share on a website but, um, but if you want to, you know, if, if you just want to state that our board has taken this action to, you know, prevent something from happening again or percent or make sure something does happen in the future then sure. Great yeah no that's a great point. Um, I like, you know, adding the minutes in there if appropriate. So thank you for knocking that curveball out of the park, Chris. Certainly <laughs> annual meetings for, for organizations that have annual meetings uh, where all their members are involved and the members have to approve these annual meeting minutes should be, should be sure. sure. Yeah. You know, my takeaway from that is that um, you almost are couching the issue of whatever the problem is in relationship to the future and prevention. Right. Did I hear that correctly? I mean, you're, you're no, that's, saying... that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, okay. things are going to happen from time to time that are not the way we plan them. But really what it comes down to uh, with a credible organization and organization you want to invest in is how do they handle that situation? How do they move forward from it? Right. And so you want to show that you're a, you're a proactive organization that cares about doing things the right way and that you actively take steps to, to make things better. Right. Amazing. Well, this has been great. Again, um, I, Jared, like I said, when I first met with Chris, um, and I, I just thought this was such an important thing to be talking about. And I don't know about you, Jared, but I don't feel like enough of us are talking about it. Maybe we're prodded when something bad happens, but um, just as a, a matter of culture, I just loved having this discussion on the nonprofit show today. It's an important one. Thank you, Chris. Really yeah, amazing. Very welcome. My pleasure. Hey, Chris Bavilak, Director of Finance and Operations at Chasen and Company. Uh, I want to really quickly, before we let you go, um, Chris, talk a little bit more about Counting on Chasen. This is a series that um, your team and I worked on through the American Nonprofit Academy. Mm -hmm. Really, really interesting. I, um, I think of it as kind of a primer for those people that are working in the nonprofit sector, but not might not know really what they should be doing. They have a lot of passion and, and they wanna work on the mission, but they need some more information about how to be specific and to be successful about you know, the, the accounting interactions. And so 
Chris, we have a, a little over a dozen, I think, episodes. I think it's exactly a dozen. Exactly a dozen. Okay. <laughs> not yeah. a baker's bit, not a baker's dozen, just a dozen. <laughs> <laughs> well, really interesting. Um, from compliance to uh, budgeting to auditing, um, really, really interesting topics um, that I learned a lot. Um, I did have some hair on fire moments, Jarrett, on camera. I must admit, where mm -hmm. something came up and I was like, holy moly, I didn't know about that, you know. Um, and so these are all free. You can go to Chasen and Company or countingonchasen.com and and get free access to this. So it's not gated, which is remarkable. Um, you can get to this information. So um, it's really been amazing, Chris, to have you and your team help us out across the sector because we need accounting help, undoubtedly. Yeah, I know we're very proud of the series and thank you for giving us the opportunity to partner with you on that. Um, you said 12 topics that we started with that we thought were um, important to nonprofits, things, things for nonprofits to, to know. It will raise new questions for people, no doubt. It will maybe direct people down a certain path that they hadn't thought of before, as, as you mentioned, those hair on fire moments. Um, and, um, you know, we hope to, uh, that was sort of our kickoff launch of those, those dozen topics. And we hope to add some topics, uh, some new topics over time and that it's uh, beneficial and love your format that you can watch it as a video or you can listen it as, to it as a podcast while walking the dog, if that works for you. So, yeah, it's, it's really been amazing. And like I said, I learned a lot. Um, I expect to continue to be um, learning any more, learning more. Um, again, everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Julia Patrick. I've been joined today by my trusty sidekick, Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd herself. We are not able to do our daily program more than 600 episodes without the support of these amazing sponsors many who have been with us from day one bloomerang american nonprofit academy your part-time controller the nonprofit nerd fundraising academy at national university staffing boutique and nonprofit thought leader these are the folks that are with us day in and day out so that we can deliver um a fresh and new approach with the nonprofit sector each and every day. So we thank them very, very much. Hey, Jarrett, it's been great to have another thought provoking episode. I'm so delighted that um, we could have this conversation with Chris. You want to sign us off today? Yeah, I would love to, you know, Every day we have been showing up, as, as we said, for about the past three years, the conver conversations evolve. And so, Chris, thank you for shining this light on accounting and transparency. It is very critical to our sector, especially as we move forward. So thanks to all of you for joining us for this Monday. We like to give Monday some fun, fresh feelings as well, because Friday gets all of the fun. But we hope you'll join us back here tomorrow. We've got a great lineup this week. And until then, please stay well so you can do well. <laughs>